Today's episode is sponsored in part by Palo Alto Networks and its Prisma Sassy, where AI-powered innovation takes center stage. Watch the new Palo Alto Networks virtual event on demand to hear how the latest innovations in Sassy can help your organization. See how ZTNA 2.0, Cloud Secure Web Gateway, and SD-WAN deliver exceptional security and ROI. Watch on demand at paloaltonetworks.com slash engage slash sassy dash signature dash moment. Welcome to Heavy Networking. On today's show, we've got a roundtable conversation on the state of automation in the networking industry. This show was inspired by the recent AutoCon conference, which is a new conference focused specifically on network automation. Uh, Ethan Banks and I both attended, as did our two guests. So we're going to share some takeaways and perceptions of the event, and we're going to get into issues such as sources of truth. That was a major topic at AutoCon. And we're going to talk about the business challenges in general of network automation. I'm pleased to be joined by Claudia DeLuna. She is Advanced Technical Consultant for Networking Automation with the consultancy EIA and Keith McGlon, sales engineer at Juniper Networks. Uh, based on the show notes for everyone, there's a lot of ideas and a lot of passion here. So I'm excited for this show. Uh, welcome, Claudia and Keith. And, you know, before we get into our takeaways about the AutoCon event, Claudia, you wanted to start with sort of with a general comment about the event. Oh, I appreciate you noticing that. Um, yeah, I I think just the fact that it occurred is something that we should not <laughs> take lightly. Um, I started looking back at it kind of when I started, I've always been a fan of network automation, and uh, I will bolster that statement by by talking about Perl and expect. Okay, so yes, <laughs> I have been a fan of network automation for some time now, and you know, in this new wave, right, uh, largely Python. Um, I started looking at when I really kind of dug in. And it's been nearly 10 years. And I think a lot of us were just kind of so much has happened, so many new tools. A lot of people say too many tools, right, are available. And this conference was, at least for me, a wake up call because it occurred and its theme was, why aren't we further? Mm -hmm. So I just want to acknowledge you know, I, I did a little um, post and and there was a little bit of disappointment for me. I love structure, right? So I wanted more formality and structure around some of the things we all know are hindering the adoption of automation. But but you know what? The fact that the conversation started, I mean, just huge kudos to uh, uh, to the network automation forum. Uh, I asked them kind of what their what their expected numbers were and what they actually got, and they were hoping. They were going to call 200 people a success at the conference, and they got over 340 from North America, from Europe, yeah. South America, and Australia. So that just tells you everything you need to know right there. Yeah, and to bootstrap a conference uh, and put on a brand new event to get that many people first time out, I think, is uh, a sign, one, of their hard work, and two, um, this appetite uh, for network automation in the industry. Most definitely. And not just the content, um, but also, you know, vendor booths, vendor support, mm-hmm. um, you know, the the little show floor, I'll call it. Um, yeah, just a huge success for them. And I'm so happy I was able to attend. It's funny what you say about the vendors, uh, Claudia, because there was good vendor support. And I talked to a few others that didn't get a booth because reasons, their budgets or timing or whatever. And they were like, next year, we'll definitely going to get a booth. We should have been here. Oh, I can't believe we missed it. Sentiments like that. So, (laughs) I mean, one of the things I mentioned, right, is there was a whole observability panel, right? And some pretty key participants in observability were missing from that, you know? Um, So I'm I'm, I'm glad that you got that kind of feedback from a lot of people (laughs) because I think it's true, but that doesn't detract from A, they had the conference and it was, you know, hugely successful, I think. And a wake up call, certainly to me. Well, in that vein, I guess I'll kick it off then with a couple of my uh, general takeaways from the event. The first one was that network engineers are hungry for automation. I got the sense that engineers know, you know, they got to catch up with their peers in other domains when it comes to automation. And there's a desire to figure out how to move from like, well, I got my scripts uh, just myself into something that's more widespread, more process driven, more repeatable, something like sustainable in the organization. The way you, the way I look at it is this, people who understand the benefits of automation are very passionate about it. And that's what we saw at AutoCon. These guys were in one room looking not just for automation, but for more information on how to grow what they're doing today and where they can go. There was also this need to kind of understand, is this, is there a better approach? Is this a good approach? Because everyone's semi-isolated in what they do and the networks are very different. So it was really good just to see everyone there and the cooperation from all the vendors and everyone was just very, very inspiring for me. 
I couldn't agree more with Keith. Um, I do think, though, that um, the people at the conference are hungry <laughs> for more automation. <laughs> and I think we did spend some time talking about one of the issues, with, which is that adoption. And I firmly believe that there there's going to be the like the new generation. And then in the in the current guard, of which I am a member, um, there's going to be those that say they look at their watch and like, yeah, man, I hope I retire or move to another industry before I have to learn this Python stuff. Um, and then there are those of us, a lot of them at the conference, right, who are like, no, we need more. We need more structure. We need more adoption. So you're saying there's maybe a little bit of sample bias in my perception about that hunger? 100%. Oh, 100%. <laughs> that, that is fair. That is very fair. <laughs> well, I, well, I think your observation, Drew, uh, highlights something else. And that, and that is the point about trying to figure out how to catch up with their peers. Because the those who are involved with network automation and have made big advances within their organization are leaders. They're on the bleeding edge. And they figured it out on their own. And that highlights the need I'm, I'm, I'm getting at. There is no one formal training program that is an industry we can look to. It's like, this is how you do network automation. This is how you need to break down your network as a system, how you need to think about it. This is how you store your infrastructure as code. This is the format your infrastructure as code should be in. Uh, this is how you're going to share that code with other people and uh, and so on. I mean, most people haven't gotten past the, the idiom that Claudia and I are most familiar with going back to our Perl and expect days. I was one of those people as well, Claudia. Uh, we wrote scripts that did things. They kind of automated a task for us, but that's not what really network automation is. It's all about doing it at, at, at a system level that's involved with a team and with other people on that team and, and everyone interacting and interrelating uh, to, to run the network in an automated way. How do you train that? How do you teach people how to do that? I think that's another thing to me that, that came out uh, in the conference is we don't have a really good approach as an industry for how to teach that and how to impart that knowledge to other engineers. Oh, just a quick note. I, I could not agree with you uh, more, Ethan. And it, it's like, how do you teach initiative? Because so far, as far as we have gotten with automation, and I think we've gotten a good way, right, but not consistently, and there's clearly adoption issues. It's all because one engineer recognized the value and took the initiative. There's no structure around supporting that. And that was a key point at the conference, I thought. Yeah, I thought so too. And I thought it came out in, a, in another observation that I had is that based on some conversations I had with folks, there are some network engineers who want vendor tools. I, I think it's sort of maybe more tied to what with what they want is structure, some kind of structure and vendor tools are a way to give them structure because my observation is that at the moment, a lot of network automation is kind of DIY, um, which is fine, but it's not really sustainable. It's not something that you can do across the organization. You need vendor tools, you need structure, you need training, maybe even certifications if you really want to formalize and advance the state of the art. One thing, one thing that comes up, and this is just my perspective, is that maybe we shouldn't be looking for one path. Why can't we have multiple paths? We have multiple vendors. They're going to have different ways that they approach automation, some better than others. Maybe someone wants to use one type of database. Someone wants to use a different type of database. I think maybe if we start laying out something called, I call like suggested practices, meaning maybe it's not best, but it's, it's a suggestion. Like if you want to go down this path, then you have, this is how you do it. If you want to take this other one, there's also a way to get that done. The networks are very different. The sources of truth should be fairly consistent, but the approach on how you use those can be different. Right. Right. I, I think that could be mapped to the way network engineering training has been for the last uh, few decades. We sure. all learned the rudiments of, of layer two and layer three, you know, routing uh, uh, various protocols, uh, VLANs and how you lay them out and how you think about Ethernet and control things. And did we all build the same network as a result of all that training that taught us all those network rudiments? No, we didn't. We took our knowledge when we got our certifications, et cetera, and applied them to the problem at hand within the constraints of uh, typically our particular budget or maybe the constraints of the vendor that we needed to work with because reasons and built what we built. I think automation could be the same way, Keith, where you teach a lot of there's a lot of pieces to this that yes. network engineers who didn't come up in the world of programming and development aren't familiar with a lot of these approaches. And so there's, it's, it feels like such a big nut to crack just to get your 
head around all these things, you know, infrastructure as code, just saying those words means so much, such a vast change that uh, I, I think we need a, a system of study, a certification, maybe something like that, that uh, gets everyone on the same page. And then, as you say, you kind of take those things you learned and apply them appropriately to your organization. Because I, I also agree with you, Keith. No, it's not going to look the same for everybody. Not everybody's going to have the same needs. Scale's got a huge uh, amount to do with it, for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Keith, I now have an idea for a third book. <laughs> and that's that's a cookbook right um yeah. i think i think it's time but you guys are absolutely right and what's worked best in the projects i've been involved with today uh you know originally it started out with okay let me go right and then solve the problem and then it went to okay nornier right because we've got a lot of devices i need some structure around it and then solve the problem and then ansible and one of the things I hope we'll talk about, right, and, and Keith had mentioned, I think we'll mention, is kind of this lack of consistency. Um, so Ansible gets messy. So anyway, and now now there are better frameworks, right? And so the what I'm trying to do today for a lot of our customers is establish that framework in their environment, leverage everything I can get from that, and then spend my time coding uh, the custom stuff, right? The bespoke, you know, things to solve that particular project. And we've had some success with that. So Claudia, uh, we were working from a shared doc, so I can see, you know, we felt, I'll see the notes that we're putting in. And so my point about vendor tools, I think raised some issues for you and I don't just want this to be an agreement fest. So, you know, push back a little bit. Why do you think vendor tools aren't the way to go in this space? No, I didn't say that they aren't. I think that we've got um, uh, a long and steep hill to climb. I, I just um, start. I, I spent half my career in the enterprise and kind of right now, um, the second half is going to be sort of service provider consultancy, right? Mm -hmm. And whenever, whenever I go into an enterprise and I was the same way when I was in the enterprise, okay, uh, vendor X, you're bringing in this tool. What am I doing with it? What's its sweet spot? I have five tools that kind of do the same thing. Which one am I doing for, you know, which one am I using for what problem? And that rigor, I, I was a hard, it was almost an impossible task to do it um, in, you know, when I worked in the enterprise and I get that a lot. When especially talking to large, you know, global, you know, Fortune 100 companies are like, yeah, we've got every tool known to man. We still have all these problems. Do not come to me with a tool. I don't want to hear it. You, it's like the first, the first way to lose them is what I have found, because we don't. And and this is and these are new tools. There, there's so much. There's so much more efficient, right? The older tools, they, they, you know, they should have taken teams. Usually you didn't get teams to support them, right? It was always it always wound up being kind of a, a, an additional duty. It drives me crazy, right? Because tools should have teams to support them, uh -huh. keep them up to date, make sure the quality of the data in the tools, make sure the the processes are using the tools, and that never happens. It's always an additional duty, and you, I think we all know what happens then. And so we have to get that story straight because we have some amazing tools available to us now. Right. That are that do solve some of these problems. And I, I I've seen it myself. I, I've literally been kind of walked out of the room. Right. If I started my pitch with here's this tool we'd like you to look at. This is tough, Claudia. This is tough because the tools got to come in at the right time. And with automation, I think there's a lot of culture changes that need to happen first and, and thinking about how we're going to manage the network has got to be shifted first. And then we can go, OK. This is our approach and this is how we're going to do it. What are the tools we want to add to the mix that are going to going to help us get there? I think if we lead with the tools, it's hard. And I, I think I'd be one of the, the the skeptical network engineers. You start pitching a tool to me and I'm going to I'm going to think back to the half dozen other hundred thousand dollar, five hundred thousand yeah. dollar tools that we invested in that we kind of got excited about for a month. And then we just kind of ground down because we couldn't make it work for us quickly enough because we hadn't made that mindset change yet we hadn't shifted how we were going to work yet and the tool came first and we weren't really ready for it and at the end of the day the thing got shelved and it's running on a server somewhere and no one really uses it anymore we just kind of went back to the way we did things because that was the most efficient way to get things done and deadlines looming and you know managers yelling at us to meet project deadlines and, and all the rest I, it feels like it would be that again and, and again going back to my point about training i think 
training isn't going to be just about tools either. It's it needs to be about that that way of thinking, the approach that you need to how you need to think about network infrastructure to get to that point where, OK, now that you know how to think about it, how do we apply uh, tooling to this? And here's a bunch of different tools that might work in this situation. Exactly. And like before, right, um, like 20 years ago, right, there they all have a little bit of overlap and some have some sweet spots and you have got to sit down, right, and articulate what problem you're trying to solve and, and you know, what this tool does to maybe, you know, get you 70% of the way there, potentially, you know, you just, you have to know, okay, this tool is only going to get me 25% there, but it's the best that's out there right now for what I'm trying to do. And here's how we're going to deal with the other 75%. Those, you know, it's just, it's hard to have those discussions with automation or anything else really. Right. Cause to your point, everyone's busy. And a lot of times it's just easier for me to do it myself. But it's a bigger problem than that. I mean, Ethan touched on the culture. I, I said in our YouTube recording that we're in our own way when 80% of the people in networking do not want to automate because they don't want to quote unquote, be a programmer that becomes a wall that you cannot get around. Mm -hmm. That becomes the mud that we're expected to run in and we cannot be effective in that environment. Just cannot. Absolutely. But I think it's, I don't think, I think we have to change the message, right? I don't want every network engineer to learn Python. Um, so there's going to be those few that have taken up, you know, the, the banner and, and off they go. And, and I'm, I, I like to think I'm one of those. And, and my goal is if I write early on, I, I'm like, you know, if I write something for me, then I'm in the way all the time. And that's just not good because <laughs> I have other things I want to learn. Right. And I want to grow in my career. So I got to write something and I got to distribute it. And I went through, I suspect what everybody went through. Right. Okay. I was working for uh, um, basically a big Cisco partner. So I'm like, okay, everyone's going to have this, this container right on their laptops. And it's got all the tools you need to do all these typical functions we need to do for clients. And that didn't go, uh, that didn't go far. Then you get to, well, okay, now I've got to build an environment. Um, oh, that doesn't work out. Where, okay. How about a web server? Well, what if I can't stand up a web server? Right. And so you have to kind of figure out how to make it easy for those network engineers that see the value, but don't want to have anything to do other than provide feedback, right, with the building of it. And so what I started doing is paying attention to how is how they were going to consume what I was providing. And then I would have, like, during the pandemic, we had, you know, Pandemic Python. Every Monday morning, we got together for two hours, and it was completely optional, and I tried to teach the team Python. Some people just, you know, hung out to listen, right? And about a couple actually really took to it. And that was okay because everyone is using the tools and I've got two people, right, that are kind of working with me to develop the code. Beautiful. I think we have to lose the idea, right, that every network engineer, at least in my generation, has to learn Python. The kids coming up, absolutely. <laughs> they should be getting, you know, uh, their CCNA and their Python certification. But I, I think we have to temper our desire for automation with some realities. I agree. But in that environment, the the old guard, as we've referred to them as, they're going to feel threatened because these new kids know something that they don't. You know, yeah. if this is my network and my place and I've been here for 10 years and I know where the bodies are buried, so to speak, I don't want you coming in with an automated way to go find all the headstones before I even know what you're doing. And then because I don't know what you're doing or how you're doing it, it, it makes me feel like I'm less valuable. I think it's what happens. So they I think go. you're right. I know, but I'm not sure I care so much. So I learned, I'm all on the job training. Um, and this is how I learned networking. Um, I came in as a junior, you know, kid. Uh, I got stolen from the development environment. Um, and there was the one guy who knew networking and he did all the work, right? He did all the configurations and he wouldn't teach me anything. So I got credentials and I would go, I knew he was going to do something. I would go in, I would save the config. I, 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 you know, he would tell people when he finished doing whatever, and then I would go and I'd do it again. And I'd look at the differences. I am not, I kid you not. <laughs> and I would just diff the files and try and figure out, okay, so he needed to set up a VLAN. Okay. So this is a new command, you know, and obviously I was trying to read books and, you know, but sure. so 
I have a lot of familiarity with the old guard and, and while I feel for them, you know, you just got to adapt <laughs> or figure out a way, right? Yeah. Some home truths there. Um, I, I feel like for section one, maybe I'll just close it out by saying there's definitely a cultural issue. And I feel like we've got a chicken and egg problem between tools and culture, you know, which comes first and, and how do you get there? And uh, we could probably spend the whole show talking about that, but we've got other juicy stuff to talk about. So I want to move on. Let's pause the conversation for a message from sponsor Palo Alto Networks. 2023 is a year when companies are going to need to do more with less. As businesses grapple with economic uncertainty, it's more critical than ever to consolidate fragmented security and networking solutions to reduce operational complexity and costs. Palo Alto Networks has a new virtual event on its Prisma Sassy, where AI-powered innovation takes center stage. You can watch this event on demand and see how ZTNA 2.0, Cloud Secure Web Gateways, and SD-WAN deliver exceptional security and ROI. Hear how the latest innovations in SASE can help your organization automate costly and complex IT operations with AI-powered digital experience management, connect and secure branch offices and the hybrid workforce with SD-WAN, ZTNA 2.0, and Cloud Secure Web Gateways, and unlock better ROI through consolidation of point solutions with Prisma SASE. Watch this event on demand at paloaltonetworks.com slash engage slash sassy dash signature dash moment. That's paloaltonetworks.com slash engage slash sassy dash signature dash moment. And now back to the podcast. First two sources of truth. Uh, we touched on a little bit already. Sources of truth were a significant topic at AutoCon. Before we get into the discussion of Baron's sources of truth and what we mean and how they work, I want to just level set. What do we? What is a source of truth for the network? Uh, Keith, you have some ideas there. Yeah, to me, a source of truth is a place where you can query or ask questions about the network that should be relatively accurate. Some things are just very difficult to stay on top of, but fairly static things like which which peers should be on this router, which interfaces should be part of that bundle. Those kind of things don't change. The SNMP strings or things of that nature. These are the kind of things you can keep in a, a directory. The, the ISP that I worked at many moons ago actually had a one folder with a file for every device in the network. It was not fancy, but whenever I had a question about, hey, where where is this customer configured? I could just run a search through those files and I had mm -hmm. it within seconds. So to me, that is a source of truth. It does not have to be just dead on accurate, but it'd be great if it was, but it is a place that your program can go take a look to give you information without the SSH login and the show command and parsing the output, or even if you're lucky enough to get the JSON back, it is a place that is off the box that you can talk to with your programs first. Claudia? I, I certainly agree, but I think um, for me, that was a kind of a, a pivotal point in the conference. I was always, look, I, and let's just take, there are many sources of truth for the network, right? We'll take the, sim the, the simplest one, right? Which is kind of how things started. And that's, I need a an authoritative, complete and accurate list of all the devices on the network. Mm -hmm. And we've got some great tools to help us do that today, but let's just starting with that one. And to Keith's point, it has to be programmatically consumable today, but We've had that need since I was, since I started out in networking, right? You have to monitor, right? You have to pay maintenance, right? You, you probably need to either tell your security to stop scanning these devices or to start scanning these devices, depending on your school of thought. Um, and so that list has always been a need and still we struggle with getting that authoritative list. So to me, there are, A, I've given up the idea that there's a single source of truth. There's going to be many for, of different types. And even if you enumerate the types, which I, I, I sort of enumerated uh, uh, the infrastructure asset list. Uh, what about a standards and patterns right list? Um, the current state of the infrastructure. Um, even if you enumerate what all these kind of sources of truth are, are we, are we ever going to get one? And I, I, the conference made me rethink that. Right. I, I, I actually now starting to agree with some of the people um, who made some very articulate points about that. I don't know that we're ever going to get there. And so for me, it's what what source of truth are you talking about? You know, how close is it going to be to authoritative, complete and accurate? And how can we make it self-healing? Right. Ethan, any comments? So many. <laughs> and and I'm, 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 oh, I don't know if I want to get into this conversation. Um, 
I quoted someone as making the point from the stage at Autocon uh, on LinkedIn and just started a thread uh, that kind of took off. And for purposes of our teeny little world that you could even say it went viral, there was a lot of people that looked at this thing and made comments and had thoughts. Um, and the point was roughly that the source of truth can't be the network itself. It's got to be something off box, kind of going to what Keith was saying earlier. And a lot of people disagreed with that or had different you know, feelings about it and, you know, and so on. And I felt like we got arguing about what, what do we mean by, by truth? And, you know, to me, the whole point of it was you want something that's a source of truth. And we have sources of truth, to be clear. I don't, there's not one single, there's different things depending on what the do, knowledge domain is you're trying to find information for. Inventory is different than uh, routing peers, let's say. Um, but you have the reality of your network, which is your network, the actual physical devices that are out there on the wire that are the, the only true source of truth from a standpoint of that is reality, what is actually happening, the way those devices are A, configured and B, actually working, which can be different things as well. Um, that is a, a certain kind of source of truth that, that again, that realistic state. But then you've got, I think, what you, you have to have off box, which is what you want the network to be doing, whether it's doing it or not. And that's a different kind of source of truth. That's what you've got stored in configurations off box in a GitHub repo, perhaps, or in uh, NetBox might could be a, a source of truth that reflects the state of how the network is meant to be, whether it is that or not. And to me, that's the the source of truth that I'm more more interested in is kind of going back to what Keith was saying. I'm interested in that off box source of truth, where in that repository, I've got a uh, a golden config let's say now, the network may not be that but that's what it should be if everything was plugged in where it's supposed to be plugged in configured where it was supposed to be configured the network operating system was free of bugs um etc et i think it's very important to have a source of truth that is that off box reflecting your intended state and i don't want to get back to intent-based networking because that term does seem to have died within the industry here over the last year but but kind of going back to those concepts from uh, intent-based networking, we were doing so many podcasts about that topic, Drew. Um, so I guess the the question is, you know, what roles, what role does do sources of truth play in automation then? If it's these sources of truth may not actually reflect the ground truth of my network, what, why do I have them? Why do I need them if I'm looking to build an automation framework? You, you have them because you're polling the network to see if the network ref is is equivalent to what your source of truth says they're supposed to be and can flag when there's a difference or in the ultimate state of, of, of network automation. Again, going back to what we were talking about with intent-based networking, you would close the loop. That is, you could actually have a system that enforces a, uh, enforces that state such that if a, a change has been detected, a cowboy change, you know, some human went in and manually reconfigured something and then the system goes, oh, that is not the intended state. I'm going to change it and then change it back to uh, to what it's supposed to be. Um, to, to me, that is the point of it. It reflects what the network is supposed to be, and you can trust it and rely upon it as such. Um, it then also becomes the central clearinghouse for any changes that are going to be through the network. If you want to update NTP servers, that's the example I've used frequently, you change them in the code repo. You don't log into a bunch of devices and change them one at a time by hand. You change them in the code repo and say, these are my new IP addresses for my uh, NTP. And then that change would be reflected throughout the system as the automation system says, oh, we have a change now, and then updates all the devices on your network to reflect that new intended state. That's exactly right. I did a session um, that was called Just Say No to Vizio. Because today, that's, well, maybe not today, but I still think for a large part, that's where we capture that, call it what you want, right? I agree, but I agree with you about intent, right? But that, what is it supposed to be? So I need to know what, it, I need to define it somewhere so I can measure against it, right? And right now, for most companies, it's in a Vizio diagram, right? It drives me crazy. Yep. Or and worse, so it's in someone's head. It's not even on oh, a diagram. Right. You're right. It's not even in a diagram. You're absolutely right. But I'm 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 naturally positive, right? So I'm going to say <laughs> charitable, <laughs> Claudia. Yeah, <laughs> it's, in a, it's in a diagram. Um, 
And, you know, it's this static monolithic thing. I can't do anything with it, right? So we have to start having that conversation. And this is one of the things that the conference I did, I think really did a good job. And your post, yes, I think it went viral. You had some some pretty heavy hitters in there kind of talking about the conversation and that's what's needed. We have to define the various sources of truth. And then the design source of truth is the one that is I'm particularly passionate about because I want my network diagram to be developed. I don't want to go in there and Visio and do it manually. I want it to be developed from the design that I've captured in whatever, JSON, in a database, you know, I, that's that's an area of tools that I don't I don't think uh has gotten a lot of attention and but maybe it will now. Um and so the diagram for the network, right, should should be reflective of whatever the state has been defined in something that is consumable by automation. So to that point a little bit, Keith, I want to go back to your initial example of that list of all the devices that were supposed to be on the network. How mm-hmm. accurate was it? And was anyone directly in charge of making sure it was updated? Uh, honestly, I don't know who maintained it because I was just a, a consumer of that information. I, I just mm-hmm. knew where it was and how to use it. The changes that I was responsible for making were just de- decommissioning interfaces and, and connections that were no longer in use by the customers to save the ISP money on the last mile charges. So for me and what I was doing, it was very accurate. And what it allowed me to do was get more efficient about the changes I was making. My list of, of circuits I needed to drop were random. I mean, they were just everywhere. There was no way to sort them by device. I could sort by circuit ID, but that's not by the device. So manually, I would be in LA making a disconnection, Amsterdam making a connection, disconnection back in New York, back to LA. But once I queried the repo, when I go to LA, I can make every disconnection in LA that is on my list based on the circuit ID. So for my change at that point, it, it worked perfectly. And that's what I was going to kind of point, point out uh, to you, Ethan, is that the way that automation begins is you have that source of information or source of truth and you use that to begin to build where what devices will you need to log into what uh, interfaces do you need to work with how do you need to change the interface descriptions do you need to uh, tag it so to speak one company I worked at whenever we would put a interface into maintenance we added a tag to the interface description all these things can kind of be done as pre-work because you have a source of information to work off of. Now, you're not going out here trying to design a, a traffic engineering across the entire network. But again, you could, to be honest, you could do the preliminary design in the automation because you have that source of truth. However, you are absolutely right. There is also a gold config type configuration that is queried against the larger networks. And that does tell you if something's out of scope and I have seen some of those networks automatically repave uh, those temporary changes and take you back to um, what is gold configuration. So, Claudia, in a post you wrote about the conference, you said that regardless of whether a source of truth is the infrastructure itself or an abstraction, the abstraction still needs to exist. Maybe this design source of truth. Why, why do we need that? So we can measure against it, right? To what Ethan was talking about, basically, right? I need to know, I know, I know what it is right now. I know its state, right? And that's the, those are the terms I like to, to kind of talk about, right? Um, the source of truth is a network. That's state to me. Mm-hmm. So I know its state, but I need to know what was it supposed to be, like we were talking about before. And so that's why I believe that abstraction always needs to exist. And I think we're looking at it it needs to exist like at the very start, right? It it needs to be like the foundational thing for a new network going in. And so I'm hoping that for Greenfield networks, maybe we can start putting in some of that structure. Uh, Brownfield networks, um, I will, I, you may have heard me say this. Uh, I always say that uh, if I have a script, it's going to be, uh, and I'm not a very good Python programmer, by the way, but, you know, it'll be like 10 lines of actually doing something and 990 lines of checking to make sure my state is the way I expect it. It is literally that bad. It is okay. That's okay. Those are pre-checks, right? I mean, pre-checks are very important, if not one of the most important things you can do for automation. 
you need to know what that device state was before your automation started, and you need to come back and make a comparison when your automation is done so that hopefully the only changes you see are the ones you expected. When that's not the case, you've got other questions, you know, you need you need to answer. Exactly. And it's actually a kind of a trinity, really, right? Because it's 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 current state. How is it different from what it's supposed to be? And what am I trying to do? So if we're building an abstraction that's supposed to represent the ideal state um, and then being able to try to run automations against it, it does this abstraction sort of also become its own full-time project and job for somebody to take care of? That's a really good question. Um, mm-hmm. I think it needs care and feeding. The level of effort, I, I don't know yet. And, and of course, this is an opportunity for vendors, right, to start looking at tools to help in this regard. So it doesn't have to be, you know, one or 10 FTEs or whatever it might be, right, but to reduce that level of effort. And honestly, if we can, if we can start thinking about don't start your network work design, right, with a Visio diagram, start it with something that is consumable all the way through. So um, essentially you you document in a consumable way what what needs to happen. You draw your diagram. You, you know, I build a, a markdown file, right, because everyone wants a low-level design and a high-level design, right? I build those from that data, right? I build the diagram, the low-level design, the high-level the high design, the low-level design, and then I build my configs, and then I push my configs, right? And so if we can start thinking along those lines, I think consistency and that process, everyone will start getting used to it. And things, you know, the more consistency, the more comfortable I'm going to be pushing change, checking for change, the pre-work that Keith is talking about, right? And the fewer times I'm going to, you know, am I going to shoot myself in the foot? Here's a problem with that, Claudia. If you're, you're to have that approach, you're looking at architectural level changes, right? The architects of the network have to think of it that way and start that way, right? Yeah. These are the. This is exactly where your old guard ends up. Once you've been a network engineer and you've done a good job and you've moved up and you're senior network engineer, your next step is usually architecture. These are the least, the guys least likely to want to make significant that. changes like that are yep. sitting in the architecture seats. You uh, although, although in theory, if you've advanced to the architect role, you're less involved in day-to-day engineering decisions and sure. you could look at automation as an engineering operational kind of decision. The architecture is the architecture, but I, but I, I also agree that the reality is the old guard that's ended up in that arch- architecture position tends to want to still has their hands in it on some level or another and may not be, be amenable to those kind of changes. Um, they the can't obstruct rigid. themselves that far. Yeah. And there, there can yeah, be a lot of rigidity. Rigid. Um, I know how it works. I'm comfortable if we do it this way. If we try it this new way, I'm not sure it's going to work out. It makes me nervous, and it's going to be me that gets called on the table if it doesn't work out well. So I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna stand in the way. So, but Claudia, go, there's one one more point I wanted to to add here about: Do we have to add? Do does some human have to be the one taking care of the automation system? Is that a full time job for somebody? Now we've talked to a bunch of people uh, on packet pushers over the last three, four years and, and had conversations around that. It depends on the size of the organization, the number of devices, but it's pretty common for someone for this to be part-time or full-time. That is what they do. They've built an automation system that constantly needs care and feeding, not because it's breaking down, but because it's become part of the organization. Everyone uses it. They want new features. They want Oh, they brought in a new device family into the organization that now the automation system needs to be able to talk to and and on and on and on the changes go. And there it does seem to be as automation makes its way into the organization, it becomes very key to that organization being able to roll out devices that, yeah, someone is really dealing with that. And the bigger the organization, the more likely it is you've got someone devoted. Uh, I was th- thinking of uh, that's pretty much all Jeremy Schulman does at MLB, uh, as I understand it. And I think he's got some other people he gets some help from, too. Now, they're an example of a big organization, and this is what they hired him to do. Um, smaller shops, I, I don't know where you draw that line. Uh, but just knowing the complexity of coding and how things change and how you need to be able to adjust for situations you didn't consider and then feature requests coming in from people using the system, uh, especially as it becomes, again, uh, 
just woven into the fabric of how you do things in operations, I think it's more likely than not that, yeah, that's going to be a standard role, someone whose job is to keep that system up and running. I think so, too. I just don't know how how big a job it will ultimately be. Right. And I think that will change based on tools that maybe don't exist today, but could exist tomorrow. But you're absolutely right. That needs care and feeding. That role needs to exist in some form. It also feeds into the argument, do I as a business want to do this, roll my own custom automation system because I have a good business reason why I should? Or is it, I really want the vendors to do this for me because I don't want to maintain the automation system. I want to buy it from them and I want to tell them the feature requests and have them release it in 2.0 for me (laughs) rather than me hire an engineer and have that headcount do it for me. I'll say this. One thing about as far as care and feeding, you have cloud customers and because that's who I work with that have hundreds of dedicated network automation people. It requires a lot of care and feeding to get it going. I think one of the challenges for the smaller companies is number one, where do they find that kind of talent that can can stand up a system, care it, design it in a way that ultimately is going toward being self-driving or self-sufficient. That's a huge challenge, but I am not sure, and this is not trying to give Juniper a pass. I know we we do some things great. We do other things not so great, but I don't think the answer is at the vendor level because the vendor is going to do what? They're going to show you how to automate their gear, nothing else. So what does that really solve for the large Well, the, the, there's, there's vendors and there's vendors, though. There's network equipment vendors like Juniper, you guys, and Cisco and Arista and all the rest. But then there's also lots of people, and we saw many of them exhibiting at Autocon Zero, where they mm-hmm. are not network equipment vendors. They are basically, they're an automation system of some yes. kind with some mm-hmm. sort of a focus. And their they're whole thing is about- API orchestrators. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, Itential and Glueware and, you know, there's other ones out there too. Of course, I can't think of their names now because of course I can't. It would be too convenient <laughs> to remember all their names. <laughs> but but this, this goes back to the, again, what business do you want to be in? Um, if you invest in making your own automation system as a company and you have that one key person who is making that system for you, what do you do as a business when that key person moves on? They leave and go do something else. And then what happens to the automation system? And we've also heard stories of, well, the automation system that so-and-so built, uh, they left and no one kind of knew how it really worked. And we all got kind of went back to the way we used to do things. And then they kind of start all over again. That's happened too, which is another argument in the, I'm looking for someone else, some third party to build the system for me and maintain it. That is true. That is absolutely true. And I've seen that as well. Um, But think about it. This is what happens when you have 80% of the team doesn't want to be involved, only wants to look, doesn't want to participate. And only 20% of the team is really doing the, the automation. You've kind of set yourself up for that kind of scenario where you lose the the thought leaders and the other guys aren't ready to pick that up and don't want to pick that up. That's not a new problem for automation, right? That's True. that that happens. And I think, you know, I'm I'm I've stopped asking companies, um, hey, you know, do you want to automate? I um before I left uh Dimension Data, so I can speak freely because it doesn't really exist anymore. Um but I, I had this whole, you know, uh, sales pitch, right, about how we can help you automate. And now looking back on it, again, the, the conference made me reflect a lot on strategies that worked and strategies that failed. And this was a strategy that failed because no one, no one said yes. So you have to frame the questions differently. Is networking impeding your speed as you roll out functions end to end, right? Uh-huh. Um, and, and do you want that speed? Do you want the quality in half the time uh, is your team out provisioning VLANs and they forget to the ad, you know, the ad word and knock <laughs> switches off the network. Um, okay. You know, so you have to frame it, I think, or at least that's how I will be framing it in the future. Yeah. Not about automation. Automation is a way to ensure that speed and quality, but I don't think that's kind of my entrance into the discussion. Okay, so you, I think, just moved us nicely into section three, which is automation as a business problem, because yes, it's a technical issue, it's a cultural issue, but the business as a whole has to see value in this if it's going to invest in it. 
Uh, and Claudia, I think you already called out one of the issues. Why as a business would I want to invest in network automation? What are the business outcomes? And it sounds like one of them is speed. Speed and quality for me is the, the way I want to have those discussions. Mm-hmm. Keith, what about you? I'm not, I'm, I'm never chasing speed with automation. I'm chasing a higher quality of work um, because mm-hmm. you think about when you do the simplest things on a network, there's there's things that a human just forgets. There's things that a human will skip just because they know it's okay. Maybe they assume because they didn't get disconnected that everything's working fine and they don't run the post checks after the change. Those are the kind of things I think really benefit automation to where you are completely consistent on the approach of how things get done because the code is there and the code gives you output to say, yes, this happened or no, it did not happen. Yes, it was good or no, it was not. I'm always chasing the the quality of the approach, never the speed, but that's my approach. But I do think Claudia pointed out something very interesting in that the network engineers are always looking at automation from how does it benefit me? How does it benefit my network? But when these conversations begin to happen at different levels, I think the dialogue has to change. When you're talking to someone in security, talk about compliance. When you're talking to somebody that's at a C-level, maybe you're talking about a, a competitor's significant outage that costs them millions or, or bill, millions and millions of dollars. Uh-huh. Bring that home and set that on their table in a language that they understand in a situation not from your perspective. And that's a, that's something we need to start to teach or start to think about as network engineers trying to champion the benefits of automation, it has to be what's in it for them. True. And speed, let me clarify something, actually, because you made a very good point. So um, when I say speed, I'm not talking about can I, you know, put the VLAN out there and trunk it faster? Not not at all. Uh, for me, speed is two things. It's was I able to deliver to my client a fully functional bit of IT infrastructure that includes network faster? Okay, so that in in that regard, that's what I'm calling speed. And the other one is, did I do all the pre-checks I should have and and that don't often get done because everyone's in a hurry and it takes a long time to, okay, that MAC address, is it there? Okay, it's not there. Well, have I seen it on the network? Okay, when was the last time I saw it? Is it on the port I think it's on? Is it on the VLAN that I think it's on in case I have to roll? All those checks that we need in a fully kind of functional, I'm moving a device scenario usually don't happen they happen when you actually have to roll it back and you're like oh man what what, what v-line was it on right and so that that speed is i did all those checks and it didn't take me any longer to be more thorough about what you've so elegantly called pre-work which is funny and i say that because that's what i call it too (laughs) so i love that Um, so that's what i mean about speed and quality but i I do want to add something here about speed though which is I think speed and actually being able to push network changes more quickly does happen as a byproduct of a mature automation practice. That is, we've done all these things that we were just talking about, pre-checks, and we know uh, what we're supposed to do before the change goes, and we know what we need to check after, and it's all been automated so that we're very confident that before we push the change, the network is ready for it. And that after we've pushed the change, the network is reflecting what we expect it to reflect. When you get to that point in your automation journey, because we're all on a journey, then you're at a point where <laughs> now you can get maybe better sign off for certain, especially low risk changes to just do them. As opposed to the world I lived in for much of my career was You can't change an interface description without it going through the change control approval board. And until you get that approval and then you do the change during the window, which you'll get once a month at 2.30 in the morning for a half an hour, you know, you're not going to make that change. I think we get away from that world and we begin to push these changes more confidently because the business has confidence in the process we've generated as opposed to, I hope the human we hired is good enough to not screw it up. (laughs) <laughs> Agreed. Agree. Now, I will I will admit, Ethan, you're absolutely right. But we remember earlier when we talked about changing the way we think about the network, let's never consider speed. It's going to be faster. We all know that. Absolutely, undeniably, it's going to be faster. But when we take that off the table as something to shoot for, then maybe we're a lot better about 
all the pre-checks, all the steps, extra steps now that it's automated that are just really good things to do that the human yeah. would not do. So I like the approach of just saying, never chase the speed because you're going to get it. If you do all these other things correctly, no. you'll have it anyway. Yeah. And actually, I'm with you on that, Keith. I'm never going to sell to senior management. You want network automation because it makes everything faster. Yeah, I'd, I would never sell that. I would sell it more as once we get this right, fewer errors, fewer yes. problems during a maintenance window where things don't go well or we have to back out much higher success rates. Um, and then again, I'm just you know, speed eventually comes as a byproduct over time. Oh. I think it does, but I want to make sure um, the speed I'm talking about is delivering a service faster. You mean mm. from, from the whole and project to delivery? Right? End yeah. to end. And, you know, yeah. so yeah. so right now, yes, I can, I can change that port, you know, in 30 seconds with a push. But because I have to go to cab, right, and I have to bring in these other people and I have to bring in the VMware team, and it takes me two weeks to get a server right? The poor group it needs to attach to. So end to end, I, the speed I'm talking about is taking that two weeks, right? Down to something less than two weeks. For the, <laughs> yeah. Right? And so much of that can be automated. I was thinking about Kat Gurinsky's presentation uh, where she talks about using APIs for troubleshooting. She just automates away a bunch of the tedious uh, information gathering that needs to be done during a troubleshooting process and makes everything go much more quickly. So uh, good example there. So yeah. I'm going to read this back as what I'm hearing. The takeaways are automation brings you consistency that leads to higher quality output, which leads to an enhancement of the velocity of service delivery, which you can put in executive <laughs> speak. For I love it. That audience. I absolutely oh, sure. love it. And, and it highlights a point that I really think network engineers need to start paying attention to. And that is, we are part of an end-to-end -end service, and I've never been able, I've never had a lot of success, right? <laughs> hey, I flipped the port, I'm, you know, I'm done, the port's on the right VLAN, I'm, you know, I'm going, I'm going to do something else now. Yeah, but that's, Wait that's a minute. not just network guys, right? The server guys no, are it's the same every, way. Yes, it's every vertical. Right. And so we have that challenge across every vertical, but it's got to start somewhere. And I'd like to be, because we're, we're actually holding up the show, man, I really believe that. It's a little embarrassing. So since we are, I'd like to be the ones that start brokering all those discussions and reset the mindset to we're delivering a service. Sure. That's fair. Okay. Well, I feel like we could probably do another hour, but uh, we don't want to exhaust our listeners' ears. So let's just wrap up with if people have a, a final thought. Uh, Claudia, I'll start with you. Oh, thank you. I, I think we've had some great discussion here about reframing, not just the questions, right, but kind of how we approach things. And and I'm hoping maybe in the next AutoCon, we can start getting into some of that. We talked about maybe a, a cookbook of sorts, right? I, I think that is needed. Reframing those questions and maybe asking different questions, right, um, is going to be necessary to move automation forward at the scale I think we all want to see it. Eve? Super exciting just to see AutoCon and how many people were willing to make the trip, invest the time, and really pay attention to the presentations. It reminds me of, of what I always thought automation could be for networking. So for me, I just hope that we can kind of move toward solutions as a industry, not saying that we have to be beholden to any single vendor or single approach. I just yeah. hope we can kind of move forward because we're far overdue for the network to be in a better state. Absolutely. And Ethan? AutoCon as a conference has hit on something important for the industry. Uh, and this this conversation, it was a mirror of several other conversations that were going on at the event in Denver. And I am very glad that there are going to be more AutoCons. And it's not an event that's expected to go on forever and ever into perpetuity, but there's going to be more gatherings. There's one to be determined happening in Europe in 2024, as well as the U.S. again in 2024. And I want to see the conversation advance, not just we rehash the same old things and kind of gripe. Uh, we've done well identifying problems. Now let's move on to 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 solutions, as we've all begun alluding to. That's that's the next phase here. 
Right. Well, Claudia and Keith, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sharing your expertise uh, and your enthusiasm for this. I think this was a great conversation. Uh, and thank you for the listener. If you're still here, if you stuck with us all this way, congratulations to you. Uh, if you like this episode, there are many more fine free technical podcasts and our community blog. It's all at packetpushers.net. You can find us online, find us on LinkedIn, hear us on Spotify, rate us on Apple Podcasts. We'll also have links to writing from Claudia, from Keith, and some suggestions that they had for additional resources in the show notes that accompany this podcast, uh, plus that uh, link to Ethan's viral LinkedIn post so you can see what made Ethan go viral. Uh, as always, thank you for listening. And last but not least, remember that too much automation would never be enough.